Enemies to the east. Enemies to the south. Enemies to the west. Enemies to the north. Enemies everywhere. We're surrounded by traitors. This year, it's like game on. It's happening. Everything is happening. You see things on a scale that you don't see on other shows. But for me, it's always the intimate story, the, the character story, what links these people. As big as it gets, it's still about these characters and what they're going through. This season includes such a convergence of storylines. All these characters who were never together before are now together, and as we get towards the final season, we really feel that everything is converging in a way that's very dramatic. This is a season, for me, in which it's no longer a Game of Thrones, it's a game of survival. Traditionally, we'll have a big battle towards the end of the season, and this year, we have battles starting in the second episode. It all starts now. Winter is here, and it's all hitting the fan from all directions. Nothing on the show does what you want it to do. <laughs> We're all gonna die. I don't know. Everything for Danny up until this point has been, I've got to get to Westeros. I've got to get to Westeros. I've got to get to Westeros. Well, now she's gotten to Westeros. What do you do now? On that journey there, she's able to kind of really think through, right, what's my first plan? But she's going into Varys' world. She's going into Tyrion's world. And she needs to know, are they going to be true to her, their new leader, or are they suddenly just going to get back into old habits? You served my father, didn't you, Lord Varys? I did. You didn't serve him long. You turned against him. Varys is the one who I think Daenerys has never quite been sure of. Because, you know, she, she maps it out pretty clearly. It's like, well, let's go through it. Let's talk about who you've been serving your entire life. It doesn't bode well. It kind of shows sort of like a fair weather friend. She needs to make sure that he's on her side. And the same thing with Tyrion. He swore that he would help her defeat his family. She knows he hates his sister. She has no question about that. But now he's going to have to fight his brother and actually destroy his family. It's incredibly complex being Danny's hand and going and fighting my own family. It was easier when it was Joffrey and Tywin. But now that it's Jamie. It's not so easy of a decision to make. The funny thing about this show is the women have all come to power. You think it's sort of this male-dominated show, but if you look at who's leading the pack, they're women, and that's a pretty fantastic spin on it all. I don't think there are that many situations in film or television where you see four women sitting around a table discussing power and strategy and war. So we thought that was fun and took it out of the realm of your general medieval war council scene, which isn't going to be a bunch of old grizzled guys with gray beards slamming their fists on a table. When we were playing that scene out, we were very well aware there would be a massive ensemble and there'd be a lot of competing agendas. And it made sense to us that Olena and Ilaria and Yara would be more like the fire-breathing warmongers. We should hit King's Landing now, hard, with everything we have. The city will fall within a day. I think everyone in that room has a very strong idea about how to do things. All that Yara's ever done is taken or pillaged, but maybe it's interesting to her to go this way. I don't know, I think she believes in Danny. We all saw that chemistry. <laughs> Tyrion's plot of attack is not to attack, really. He wants a solution without everyone dying, because he has a heart. There's all these people who really have no part in these wars, for lack of a better word, civilians. One of the things that's constraining Danny is that she's a moral person and she's being advised by a moral person in Tyrion Lannister. And so it would be easy for them to just go and conquer King's Landing. You know, if the three dragons fly there and attack, um, they could burn the city down and it would take one day and Danny would rule and the Lannisters would be defeated. But that also means killing tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of civilians. And Danny's not willing to do that. I am not here to be Queen of the Ashes. Cersei has no moral qualms about doing anything and everything that's necessary to maintain her grip on power. So there are certain strategies that are available to Cersei that aren't available to Danny. She starts to form her plan, then her game plan. You invited the Greyjoys to King's Landing. I invited Euron Greyjoy, the new King of the Iron Islands. I think the Euron connection for her is she sees someone who she can Again, this is Cersei's thing. She's always cleverer than everybody else. 
she can always manipulate better than anyone else. So she thinks he's equally as ambitious as she is and ruthless, and she can control him and use for exactly what she needs. You know, she has no intention of giving him what he thinks he wants from her. Euron is a different kind of character uh, that we haven't really had on the show so far. He has goals and has things that he wants, but Euron's way of going about getting the things he wants is a lot more rock and roll. This is the life. Power is not something that's given to you. It's something you have to take. That's what I like about this character, that he takes what he wants. And you know what? It's always more fun to play a baddie than a good guy. To have somebody traipse into the throne room and just have so much fun, it was a really fun scene to write, and it was an even more fun scene to watch Pilu bring to life. I was slightly jealous, because I always say to Dan and David, can I, ju can I just ride one horse, please, and one sword? I'm resigned to a life of chairs and talking. So every time I see anybody doing anything cool, you know, and he comes down the stairs and he's all in leather, and you're like, <gasps> I find it very upsetting, you know. He comes in here and he has the coolest looking outfit of all. He looks like a rock star. And he has the funniest lines. So here I am with a thousand ships and two good hands. Euron Greyjoy has built the largest armada in this world, probably the largest armada anyone's ever seen in this world. He's a wild card, but he is a wild card who is naturally aligned with Cersei and Jaime. He's one of those guys that if he's get a challenge, he needs to take it and he needs to prove himself. So why not kill your queen's enemy? And um, we needed a good sea battle in this series, right? In this show in particular, the sets like never cease to amaze me. The amount of work that they put into them, the amount of detailing, you feel like you're on like a massive ship. It's everything actually for the actors. If you go into the surroundings and they're there and it's live and it feels organic, then you don't need to do anything as an actor. You just need to be there. The silence is a massive warship that needed to be designed for the sequence where Euron hits Yara's boat. And so we designed a big naval ram that was on the front of that boat that would then crash into Yara's. And we had the Corvus itself that could also be this very aggressive thing that then all latches onto her ship. The other big thing about Silence was its scale. We wanted to be able to establish a much far superior, bigger boat. The boat itself doesn't really come into play until it's connected to Yara's ship. And so we decided that the best way to really put across the true size of this boat and still make it possible and functional was to build a section of it, the bow section that rams into Yara's boat. They only built it like the front of my ship and the side of it. And it was like five times bigger than their little tiny boat. You know, it was just, this, it was like, their boat was this big and mine was this big. It was such a great, humongous, mean looking thing. So it just seemed like the personality match with Euron it was so spot on, it was so right for that character. The challenge beyond that is then to sell the idea that this was happening at sea, and yet we're in a car park in Northern Ireland. But I needed to have water, and Sam's first ever was, well, we'll just blast a load of water against the sides and it will splash up. And it, it blew me away, I loved it. Then we're gonna have fire here and fire here and up on the sails and they'll fire everywhere because Sam is obviously a pyromaniac. So there's a lot of elements in there. The whole thing was a dance. I wanted it to feel like the violence uh, of a riot or football terraces when there's a flash of violence and it just kicks off. Nothing should look choreographed and that's what we were trying to do with the sea battle. Euron's just a brute. The actor Pilu who plays him just relishes in the fighting. It's a fun thing for him to annihilate people. I have an ax, right? Of course he has an ax. He doesn't fight with a sword, he has an ax. So the first hit I have, and blood just came like And you know, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. The key moment, I suppose, for me at least, is trying to achieve a sense of loss and betrayal in that final moment when Yara realizes that her brother is broken and, uh, and will not come and help her when Yoren has a knife to her throat. I think initially she feels like Theon's back, it's okay, he'll do something, he'll do the right thing. And then the change that happens in his eyes, she realizes that he's not gonna stay. I think she's heartbroken at that point, that he's 
done that when they've gone through so much together and she's made so many attempts to save him. The laugh Euron gives as he's got his niece and she's crying, it's just to me, that's the character's encapsulation. That's why this is somebody you should be worried about. As ruthless as Cersei has been to Tyrion, and as much horrible history as they have with each other, the Cersei that Tyrion left in season four is a very different Cersei as well. She's the Cersei that uh, blew up the Sept and took the Iron Throne. And I think she's underestimated by these invaders. He definitely underestimates Cersei, his sister, and I feel he's guilty of being maybe over too confident because his strategy fails with Casterly Rock. Jamie has had a long history of failure on the show. This is someone who was supposed to have a very bright military career and future, but he spends most of his time in those initial seasons as a prisoner of war because of his initial failure in season one where he's outsmarted by Rob Stark. Jamie learns from that mistake that he made, and he anticipates that Tyrion is going to strike not against King's Landing, but against Casterly Rock. The siege of Casterly Rock is so much about what doesn't happen, how it goes contrary to expectations. So in order for us to understand that it doesn't play out the way Tyrion expects it to, you really need to hear Tyrion's expectations. So he's kind of narrating us through it. The gates of Casterly Rock are impregnable. The fight up the walls will be hard. We will be at a disadvantage. Casterly Rock was a location that we tried to find in many different places. When we were in Spain, we were looking for it the whole time, just like we were looking for High Garden. And then what we ended up with was right under our noses. And that was our river run set that we used uh, last year. One of the advantages we had was that also because Mark did shoot it last year, he knew what to do to make it look different. Even though we only see it once this season, it still obviously has to be a living, breathing entity. So with only 40 foot of battlement to actually put live actors on and ladders up against, uh, that, that was a huge challenge for the visual effects department. Where are the rest of the Lannisters? Jamie makes the strategic decision to give up Casterly Rock, you know, to use it as a decoy, to lure the Unsullied over there, to take it and to get them on the exact wrong side of the continent. And meanwhile, he goes after Highgarden, which is much more valuable because Highgarden's the Tyrell stronghold, which commands all the most fertile regions of Westeros. When we're in Highgarden, that's a lovely location that they found in Almodovar, Spain. Uh, it's a great old castle. There are shots where we see it where Jamie's approaching it. Those were shot completely differently, and we shot a plate of the castle and put it into that scene. And then Alina's look out of her window to see Jamie's forces arrive. Alina was shot on a stage, and of course, Jamie's forces were all shot here in Spain. So it is sort of combining a couple different things from a couple different locations. The taking of High Garden was structured like that specifically for a visual and tonal variety. Having already seen the taking of Casterly Rock, the writers and I felt that if we were to then repeat another you know, battle sequence, then we'd basically be repeating the similar beats. Uh, the, the important emotional beat it was to get Jamie and, and Diana's character, uh, Lady Elena, into the same room. That was what the real battle was. Your brother and his new queen thought you would be defending Casterly Rock. The truth is Casterly Rock isn't worth much anymore. It was a uh, ruthless, smart choice by him, which Tyrion later praises. Abandoned the family home, completely unsentimental. Father would have been proud. It's nice when Tyrion isn't always right. It's great when these characters make errors, make mistakes, um, proves them more human. Enough with the clever plans. I have three large dragons. I'm going to fly them to the Red Keep. When everybody else's plan goes to pot, the only thing to come out is like, I'm going to do this my way. And the way that I do it is to be a dragon. She wants a victory. She's tired of holding back while Cersei stabs her in the back repeatedly over and over and over again. And she sees an opportunity to take out a large part of Cersei's army without burning down castles, without incinerating villages. And she wins a great victory and destroys much of the Lannister army. I think one of the pitfalls of this genre is that they're action sequences, which are simply there to be action sequences. This is a character-driven show. 
Every single scene must be about one of the characters, and we can't stop applying that rule when we get to the action sequences. When you have a big battle sequence, especially one where you have multiple points of view, you have to figure out how you balance those and whose eyes do you want to primarily tell the story through. I chose to focus on Jamie, that it was about being on the other side of a dragon attack. You have Daenerys Targaryen unleashed for the first time in Westeros, and it's about Jaime Lannister trying to hold together his troops in the middle of watching the world change forever. Dracarys! The loot train is certainly bigger than anything we've done up to this season. There's a lot of different beats to the attack. There's Drogon setting lots of things and people on fire. There's the sheer scale of how many Dothraki and how many Lannisters there's supposed to be in this scene. We have 200 extras, we have 60 or 80 horse people, and it needs to look like a cast of tens of thousands. We had to alter the environment a little bit just to fit, you know, the 100,000 Dothraki on horses uh, that needed to attack these guys. As each season comes along, the dragons and the CGI gets more impressive. To give an idea, in uh, season six, we had 11 shots that featured Amelia riding the dragon. This year, we have over 80. The dragons double in size every year. And the dragons were huge last year, and this year, they're twice again. So the dragon buck, which is the practical thing that Amelia sits on, is also twice as big. You know, environmentally, we're changing the skies, so the overall progression of the scene is, you know, beautiful sunny skies to completely claustrophobic black smoke and ash and dark and, you know, hellish situation. There's nothing you can do. There's just nothing you can do. So the only thing he does try to do is to take her out. What gets the heart racing, hopefully in that sequence, is Jamie Lannister grabbing a spear, riding for Danny. He wants to kill her. <laughs> and you don't want him to. At the same time, you don't want her to turn around and torch him. <laughs> this is the first time we've ever had two sets of main characters on opposite sides of the battlefield, and it's impossible to really want any one of them to win and impossible to want any one of them to lose. And Tyrion has the most complex set of emotions about this battle of anyone because he's got the woman he serves on one end and he's got his brother who he loves on the other end. Seeing my family lose and his brother Jamie perhaps about to be killed, it's, it's a real struggle for him. Every piece of his being is wishing he can intercede, but he can't. There was a very slight chance that maybe, just maybe he could get there in time and kill her. He would die, there's no question about it. He knew that he was not gonna survive that. This whole sequence, you suddenly like, oh my God, I'm living out these kind of dreams I had as a kid. And it's amazing to be put in this situation and have so much going on with the fire around me. It's so it's like, yeah, don't have to think about acting so much. You're just like, yeah, I'm there. To see the skill of the stunt guys, of the riders, I mean, what they do in camera is amazing. And they're performers for a reason. They're really talented at what they do. And they'll have ideas about how oh, this would make this fight better, or this would raise the stakes. The horse department is the same way. Camilla, who's the head of the horse department, she brought some great ideas to us. She said, what about when, the, as the Dothraki are coming down, if they all just stood up on their horses and started shooting arrows at them? And I thought, well, that sounds great, but that's not possible. <laughs> she said, no, it is. We made these little leg frames to put one foot in so to, to enable that, because it's pretty impossible to do without some assistance. So we have these guys standing up. We're endeavoring to try and, you know, create something that somebody hasn't seen before. This battle was the most fire-intensive one we've had. According to Rally, we set the world record for setting most stuntmen on fire in a single shot. And it looked like it. It was, it was pretty damn impressive to be there on the day watching that happen. The dragons have grown. You know, they're the size of a 747 now, so they're big. So you'd think then that the amount of people they burn in one go would increase, you know, and it was, there was a few raised out eyebrows when I suggested 20. But it wasn't just because it's a record, although it is. Um, it was because, you know, we just needed to see the scope of what was happening. So that was quite a challenge, and it's not been done before. You know, the most I've done before that was six. Now six seems like a sedate number. <laughs> 
George Martin's often said that the Dothraki are kind of an amalgam of American Indian tribes and the Mongols who would often fight more traditionally organized armies and make them look foolish because they were just so unorthodox in their battle approach. So definitely got a bit of that Western feel, but then he throw dragons in. One of the things we wanted to do with the dragon fire now is to sell how powerful a weapon it is. We've seen younger Drogon burn people, but now he's the size of a 747. The diameter of his dragon breath is 30 feet. And so if you're in the middle of that, you are completely gone in an instant. And that was one thing I wanted to do early on, was to, to tell the story of the power of that. The special effects department led by Sam Conway did a brilliant job of building these charcoal paper figures that turn into dust the minute that you turn them on fire and blow air at them. And so we have some of that happening throughout the loot train. And then later we see it with the Tarleys. When you're watching Danny execute the Tarleys, you know, hopefully there would be some argument about what she's done. From her standpoint, she's not acting uh, insane in any way. She's just being tough, which is what she needs to be to win. And that's one perspective. Tyrion has a different perspective, and hopefully people watching it will have their own, and they'll decide for themselves whether they think what she did was just or immoral. I think this is an argument that the show is continually presenting both sides for. Always. It's asking you, the audience, to question what power means, what it is to have it, what it is to keep it, and how is it best exercised. It's when his son steps forward and throws himself in with his father. That's really the place where Tyrion's counseling don't destroy the entire future of this house because of the father's decision. And she decides that she can't let him go. It's that that really I think starts to make Tyrion maybe a little bit uneasy. Tyrion is most definitely genuinely concerned for Daenerys. From then on, she's questioning my loyalty to her. And I think Tyrion is questioning his own loyalty to her. I am her hand, not her head. I can't make her decisions for her. That's what I used to tell myself about her father. Who's that for? Jon Snow. What's it say? Nothing good. The letter from Bran says that the army of dead's marching now and there's no more time. The clock is ticking. So that forces Danny into a decision and John into a decision of what do we do now? We can't sit on this island anymore. Like the, the, the other war is starting whether we want it to or not. Like many of these situations on the show, the one who figures it out is Tyrion, you know, which is the only way you're going to prove it to people is to show it to people. Very often on Thrones, one of the best things is the sets we have around us. And in the dragon pit scene, the atmosphere there it was just so incredible. Italica is a phenomenal location. It's not often you would ever get permission to shoot somewhere, you know, where the Romans built and uh, that still has Roman concrete. It's unbelievable. Just as somewhere that you might go as a tourist, it's something that you ought to see when you're in that part of the world, let alone as a film crew, be able to go there and shoot. It was such an enormous honour and something that I'm still quite shocked we were given permission to do. I know for Team Pedestra it was very difficult to shoot. This is one of the more complex scenes I've ever been asked to shoot. You have almost the entire cast of the show in one place for a very long sequence with very important and very specific beats to capture. You have like Cersei seeing Tyrion for the first time in a long time, her mortal enemy. That's a moment. The first time Euron sees Theon. And, you know, what's that moment? So do that times 500. <laughs> and that's kind of what this scene is. You know, you've got a dragon coming. Many people have never seen a dragon before. Of course, Danny arrives on dragon. <laughs> And she tries desperately to not be impressed by that arrival. And everyone else, obviously, as you would, is standing up in awe of this. And then, you know, in walks this young beauty of a queen, and she's immediately beyond frustrated on many levels. And then all she gets from Danny is apologies. We've been here for some time. My apologies. And that then drives her in the scene. She can't bear it. It's this quiet, subtle, 
battle of the death stairs, really, between the two of us. <laughs> it's, yeah, it gets kind of intense. And then you have the moment with the white where Daenerys has seen it and she's aware of it and it's frightening, but she is just watching Cersei. Like, she just needs to know that this has affected her so that she can know that we can lay all our cards on the table and believe that when she says that she will have a truce, she means it. After they see the dead men in the dragon pit, Jamie realizes that all of these crazy tales that people have been telling, including his own brother, are true, and that there is a war coming that's threatening everyone. It doesn't matter what side you're on. And he takes Cersei at her word when she says that the Lannisters will fight alongside the North and Danny against this threat. And I think a part of Jaime is even happy to do so. He's always been tagged with the moniker of Kingslayer and a, a traitor, and he finally gets to be on the right side. And then Cersei takes that away from him. The Starks and Targaryens have united against us and you want to fight alongside them. Are you a traitor? I made a promise. Jamie leaves and she never, ever, 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 ever thought that would happen. She sees it as a total betrayal. I just think we leave Cersei ready to roll into season eight, where I, I just think she's gone. We don't know what the repercussions of this are going to be, but we know something big is going to happen next season. <laughs> Last season, we had a pretty triumphant ending with Danny finally sailing west towards Westeros with her fleet. But this one is definitely much more horrific, and so much of the pressure falls into the laps of our VFX geniuses. Of course, whatever we can shoot, we did shoot. We have uh, the Night King on a motion base on the back of Visceron. We had a piece of wall fabricated by the special effects and art department teams that we blasted it with a flamethrower that was mounted on a 3D motion control cable cam rig. We shot elements of whites on green screen that will be the basis of the white army traveling across. We shot tons of plates in Iceland at an environment that replicates the just north of the wall at East Watch look. So all of that will come together, and a lot of it is virtual. For the Ice Dragon, we looked back at the models that we created when Tyrion visited the two sick dragons, because we'd gone down a long road of what do the emaciated, you know, starving dragons look like. And they're sick, and they're holding their heads in a different way, and their ribs are poking through the skin. So we started with the season seven Viserion model, and sort of combined it with the season six sick Viserion model. And then we did a lot of research on, you know, ice buildup on cars and buses, basically. Where does the snow and the ice build up? And then we transferred that to the dragon because he's obviously flying always in the snowy, icy environment. The hardest, I suppose, would be the collapse of the ice wall. It's so digital and it has so much particle sim work to do, which must be exactly right or you know, the whole sequence fails. This sequence is a real testament of just the dedication and commitment of that whole team of people working around the world to make something that's impossible and unreal seem so real and so present. We write, and then the wall comes tumbling down, and it's really easy to type those words, but it's really hard for them to make it look good. Couldn't think of what would be a greater like season finale than the wall falling and the army of the dead marching on the living. Like, since season one, the whole one of the tropes of the show has always been the wall can hold off the army of the dead. So the wall breaking, how could you ever top that? As a season closer, it's phenomenal. It's like the whole paradigm shift. Okay, the wall is not gonna protect you. The enemy is coming. Winter is here. It's snowing in King's Landing. It's like, all right, fur is gonna fly. Something's gonna happen. Watching it take shape and come together and, and seeing how much fun the actors had with it, that's what really thrills me about it. And the characters are going to a place that they never have before. They're facing the conflicts they know will, will decide their fates. And you know, it's all getting real.